Hey guys, welcome back. Today I'm going to be teaching you some things to keep in mind when making a realistic fire sim in Axiom. This tutorial is going to be way more focused on specific fire settings. If you would like to see a more in-depth breakdown of my workflow, then you can check out this video on the screen now for more information. The node network does look a little bit crazy, so I'm just going to do a very quick rundown of what's exactly going on. First thing you've got here is me bringing in my house FBX. I then convert that to polygon, transform that down to size so it is the proper scale. I then scatter points on the house to source for fire. After that, I just add an attribute noise, which is adding noise to the density attribute. And I've just animated that to expand ever so slightly as the timeline goes on. I then make a new group targeting particles with a density more than one. I blast away all the particles that are not in that group. This is so that I can cheat a really simple fire spread effect. I then add even more noise to the density attribute. I randomize the P scale. Then I choose a point velocity node to add some curl and conical noise to the velocity attribute. I then volume rasterize the density and the V. I blast away everything that is not density. I add the required axiom name tags for fuel and temperature. I merge those two together. This part of shooting here is simply the collision setup, which is a VDB from polygons on the house, a uh, volume adjust fog to get the proper dimensions, and then naming the volume collision in the VDB uh, from polygons so that it collides, and plugging that into the merge as well. I'm then plugging that into my Axiom Solver, which I'm using the file cache to visualize because it's quite heavy sim, and then that goes into a pyro bake volume node in which I visualize the fire. In terms of pure fire simulation, you only really need these highlighted nodes. The rest of the stuff here is the smoke simulation that comes off of the fire, which looks like this. And then you have the embers simulation down here. All right, let's get into the details of what I've done in the Axiom Solver to make the fire look like this. When you want to make realistic fire, one of the things you should know before you even start putting down nodes is how the fire you want to make should look in real life. One of the things we all inherently know from seeing fire but may not realize is that smaller fires will flicker and seem to move a lot faster, while bigger fires will seem to move a bit slower. This obviously depends on a lot of variables like wind, turbulence, how hot the fuel of the fire is, etc. One of the best ways you can figure out how your fire should move is to get a reference of something your scale. For example, there's plenty of great fire reference on the internet, uh, as you can see here. And that kind of reference should really give you an idea of how quickly your fire should move, how far up into the sky your fire should uh, reach, how much smoke it should give off, how fast the embers are moving. It really gives you a lot of information before you start your fire simulation. So I highly, highly, highly recommend you get some reference for your fire before you even get started. Another thing that good reference gets for you is getting the color and the exposure correct of the fire. Fire can look very different depending on if it's taken at night or if it's blown out in a daytime shot or if it's taken on a phone or a camera with a very wide range um, or a big sensor. It changes everything. So it really depends on the look you're going for as well. Now you have an idea of what you want your fire to look like. One of the first things I do is go into my Axiom Solver, go into my simulation tab and change the time scale. For the scale of the house I have here, I set mine at 2.35. However, you can't just copy this. The reason you can't copy this is because I set my house to a very specific scale in uh, Houdini. Your house import may not be the same scale, therefore your fire will not react the same. This is something you're going to have to experiment with and you're just going to have to find the right balance. For example, the fire simulation you're seeing on screen now was done at a time scale of 4, which is almost double the time scale that I have for my big house simulation, simply because the scales are so different. One of the reasons time scale is also so important is because it really gives the fire the energy and the flicker it needs to look like real fire. For example, here's a simulation that has the exact same settings as the one next to it, however the time scale is on one instead of four. They are completely different looks. Before you play with any other settings, I really recommend that you get your time scale correct because that's going to drive the rest of your simulation. And in fact, changing your time scale will change how much effect other things on your simulation have, like dissipation. I know I've been talking about time scale for a little bit now, but it is really important. And one more thing to note is that if you have fast moving fire, you're going to want to bump your sub steps up accordingly. I only use sub steps two for this fire simulation because I really like the way it looks. But technically speaking, the more sub steps you get, the more realistic your fire will look. However, you're going to really want to art direct this because if you have too many sub steps, your simulation is going to take forever. And also, it just might not look like the way you want it to. Some really chaotic fire, for example, may even look better at lower sub steps than a higher sub steps. Before we move on from this main tab, you should know that fire simulations do require a lot of voxels. Here alone, I have about 305 million active voxels 
just in this fire simulation, so that's not including the smoke that I sourced off of it later. One thing that I also struggle to realize is that your source needs to be just as high resolution, if not higher, than your actual simulation. This seems really obvious in hindsight, but I thought I could get away with blocky volume uh, attribute rasterized sourcing with really high res fire and that's just not really gonna work especially in a simulation like this where you can clearly see where the fire is coming from which is the walls of the building in the sourcing tab there's really nothing crazy going on here i just make sure that all of these top three here the density temperature and fuel are all set to frame step instead of time step so they do not scale with your time step otherwise they would be going crazy you can play with that if you want you'll get some insane results all I'm doing here is scaling the sourcing of the temperature up to four and keeping it on add. It's going to do exactly what it sounds like. It's just going to scale the temperature sourcing from the simulation way up. And I also bring in the velocity up to a two um, because I want a faster moving fire. But again, this is up to you to art direct. The rest of the stuff I leave exactly as is. And in the simulation tab here, we have the most important settings that will have the biggest impact on what your fire looks like. I really don't recommend copying the exact settings I have because again, your scale will probably be different, but I'll run down the list and give you a decent idea of what these do. I've just pulled up a lighter weight scene so I can show you the effects of the settings uh, a lot more responsibly as the scene beforehand is really heavy and would be pretty inefficient to go through all the settings and play in the timeline. As you can see, there aren't that many nodes. So we have a really simple fire sim here and just with the right settings, it can still look really good and pretty quick to play in the viewport as well, making it really easy to art direct. The first thing we have here is dissipation, and this is going to affect how much of the pyro will disappear each frame. This limits, in essence, how tall or big the fire can spread upwards. Uh, I do want to know it does affect smoke way more than it does fire. If you want the equivalent setting for fire, it's going to be the cooling rate. But if we do want to change the dissipation a little bit, we can go ahead and bring that to like one, and it should make the fire a little bit shorter. And as you can see, the fire is just a little bit shorter, but it's still reaching up because of the cooling rate setting. So I'm going to go ahead and reset that to what it was. So the cooling rate is going to have a much more drastic effect. If we go ahead and bring this up you'll, and press play, we'll see that the fire doesn't even really reach outside of its source. If we bring that back and do the inverse, you're going to see that the fire uh, reaches a lot further out. It's not cooling down as quickly and you get a fire that reaches a lot further up and it flicks out uh, way more. I'm gonna go ahead and bring that back to normal. Diffusion is one I leave alone. All it does is basically blur the temperature field. Um, so I'll bring this up. You're not gonna really see much of anything. Buoyancy is again exactly as it sounds. It's just gonna determine how buoyant the fire is. So it, the less buoyancy you have, the less it will rise up. The more buoyancy you have, the more it will rise up. Here we have a buoyancy of negative eight. So our fire is actually shooting down and we can do the inverse as well. If we bring that back and set this to eight, a positive eight, you'll see the fire is shooting upwards. However, we do have some wind elements acting on this. It was really shooting upwards. So you're not going to see much more of a difference in that. And here we're coming across some of the most important settings in the XM solver, in my opinion, and that is the disturbance. The disturbance is going to add details in your velocity field, which is going to give fire a lot more detail. It's going to give it a lot more life. It's going to give it those really good uh, flicks that you're seeing here, even in the low resolution preview. Um, however, it's worth being careful with dissipation, which is my, why mine is set to only 0.1. <laughs> um, if you set your dissipation to something like one, you're going to see it adds a lot of noise to the velocity field. Uh, so it's definitely a setting that you need to be reasonable with unless you want to end up with a simulation uh, that looks like the heat death of the universe so we're going to stop that and bring that back down to point one and um so the dis disturbance here i've left the settings completely alone uh, if you scroll down you can control the settings for all of the um effectors that we've got here but disturbance and disturbance disturbance one and disturbance two i've left completely alone again this is one that you're going to have to art direct yourself depending on the scale of your fire and the look you want but luckily it's really easy to tune uh, and it's really lightweight to add into your simulation. So it really shouldn't be a problem to figure out how you want it to look. You might be wondering why there's multiple disturbances and multiple turbulences. That's just because uh, they control different size blocks of the effector. So for example, turbulence one is a swell size of 0.5 or turbulence two is a swell size of 0.2. That means if we crank up turbulence one, it will give us a bigger turbulence swirls and turbulence two will give us smaller ones. So for finer detail, um, and I'll just show you an example here. So if we turn off turbulence two and crank up turbulence one to let's say 20, and we play that, you're gonna see the fire is a lot more wild as it's getting uh, flung around. 
by higher swell sizes. And we can actually bring that swell size up as well. Let's bring this up to 1.5 and play that. And you can see the swell size is even <laughs> way bigger now, way more dramatic, um, looking a bit crazy. But again, that's completely up to you, depending on what you want your fire to do. And then we have confinement, which is a little bit harder to visualize um, at this resolution, because like I said, you need a lot more voxels to see the fire well. Um, but I can still explain what it does. What confinement does is that it essentially adds a little bit more detail to your fire in certain places. So if we bring this up dramatically, you'll be able to see what it does. It's very similar to the dissipation field. And you can see now it's a lot fuzzier where it's trying to add detail basically everywhere, which is not what we want. I like to use confinement at very, very small values. Um, like, it's like a little bit of seasoning. You don't want too much salt on your food, uh, the same way you don't want too much confinement on your fire. But don't let me tell you how to cook. And, you know, don't let me tell you how you want your fire to look. Again, it's completely up to you. I'm just letting you know what the sayings do and how I use them. In the color tile, I didn't render my scene in Houdini. So I'm not using any of these render settings. So I just leave those alone. And in the control field down here, I have left that off completely, which is the default. And in the combustion tab, I have left it completely off because we are already using temperature. So we don't need to turn on the combustion. We're just using the fire visualization from the Pyro Bake volumes node, um, which is just down here. And that gives us all of the fire uh, visualization that we need. We don't need the combustion, which is good because it's just one less thing we need to worry about. If you're rendering in Houdini, you may have noticed your fire looks a lot more like this than it does like this. That's because I have restricted the mapping range in the Pyro Bake volume node to bring the fire down. And I'm going to show you how I did that just now. One of the first things you can do really easily is to bring the minimum source range on the fire down. So you can start at something like, a, say, 0 0.5 and see how that looks. 0.5 for me is looking a bit short, so let's bring it down to 0.3, uh, 0.4, 0.45. Let's stick with 0.4. 0 0.4 is looking good, and the fire is not reaching up to the great heavens, and you still get that uh, great flickering that you get from the fire I showed you. Again, this is what it looks like a 0, and this is what it looks like a 0.4. You can also change the maximum, something like 1.5, to bring the higher end of the fire down, but that's completely up to you. Uh, I just wanted to put that in there because I know I've seen a few tutorials that have left this part out. If you are rendering in cycles, you're going to have to do this a slightly different way, which I can get into in another video if people would like me to. But if you're rendering in Houdini, this is the way you would bring the fire down. In the output tab, in the output tab, I've left basically everything the same. One quick tip I have for you is that if you want quicker previews, you can turn off velocity and temperature and just visualize the density. This will be a lot quicker and it will save file size if you're catching them. However, you won't be able to visualize the fire field. So you're going to have to put the display flag back on the Axiom solver and then you'll get a much faster preview without the velocity and temperature fields. Just make sure to tick those back on when you're done so you can, you know, have the fire. In the settings tab, I have field precision set to 16 bit. It is 32 bit by default, but you're really, really, really not going to see any different in quality. Um, between 32 and 16 bit and 16 bit is going to save you a lot of hard drive space So just set a 16 bit and don't worry about that. Other than that all the settings are the same That's really all you need to understand to make decent looking fire in in Houdini Axiom I made this little example in like five seconds and it's really quick to To our direct which is the great thing about Axiom. It's really quick to render. It's really quick to simulate uh, and it's really quick to change on the fly. If you came for the fire, that's all I really have for you. That's all the settings I use. That's all I consider when I'm making a fire simulation at the moment, other than the embers. However, there is another thing I like to do to source my smoke. You may notice that I don't have any smoke coming off of this fire. That's because I use a different pyro sim sourced completely off of this one to make my fire, uh, which I'll show you now. We're back in the big boy scene now, and I'm just going to very quickly show you how I do my smoke. Um, my simulation does have a little bit of smoke coming off here, but it's nothing like the big plume of smoke you see in my render or that I showed you earlier. So after my final fire simulation, all I do is I bring that over here to a null so I can split it off and I put it into a blast. In this blast, I'm just targeting uh, the velocity attribute and I'm destroying everything that is not velocity. I'm plugging that into a merge and I'm doing a blast that is destroying everything that is not temperature. So I just get the temperature and the velocity. Um, which is why I need to source this. And then I'm doing the exact same sourcing simulation I did earlier with the name. I'm just naming temperature, density. So I can turn the temperature from this simulation into density as a source. Plug that into a null, which you don't need to do. It's just to get a nice bare right angle on my um, node here. And I'm plugging that into a merge. And on the merge, this is what it's looking like. It's just our smoke simulation, as you saw. I then hit a VDB resample. 
and I bring the resolution of that way down, as you can see, with my nice smooth viewport compared to my um, <laughs> very laggy viewport on the heavy sim. So I just VDB resample that because we're not going to need a very high resolution uh, smoke that's coming off of the fire. Um, as a source, at least. You can change the resolution of the, or the voxel size of the smoke itself, but for the source, we really don't need anything that high resolution, as, you know, a lot of it's going to be underneath the fire anyway. I then just put down a volume visualization. It's set to smoke by default. I haven't changed anything in that. It's just, you know, targeting the density field. I've left everything else alone. I then file cache my source, so I don't have to have that whole thing in memory. And that's plugged into a merge, which has a node flying off into the distance, which just comes from my uh, volume adjust fog, which has my collision for the house. So I just have that plugged in so I can have the smoke collide with the house just like the fire does. I then plug this into my Axiom solver, the exact same way we did to simulate the fire at first. We're just sourcing it off of the fire from the original simulation. And then I plug that into my Axiom solver, which I'm not going to target because it'll be a bit slow. So I've just gone ahead and file cached it out. And then we play that. We can see here we've got those big, big plumes of smoke coming from our fire source, which will give us an accurate smoke source because it's coming exactly from our fire. It's a separate simulation. You can composite this exactly how you want. You can render them layered on top of each other. That's completely up to you. Um, one trick I did use to speed up this up was I copied my original uh, Axiom solver. And then I just pasted it here. I brought the division size way down to 0 0.04. Uh, and then I obviously, you know, I tweaked some settings here to get a different look. But other than that, these are settings I used if you're curious. But other than that, it was really quick setup. You can have the smoke be even lower res if you want. In my case, I didn't even need it this high resolution because it's a nighttime scene and you can't even really see the smoke. But if it was a daytime scene, you know, you might need more detail. You get the idea. But that's really it. I did all of the rendering in cycles. So if you're curious about my fire shader in cycles, I can do a video about that if you really want to know. I don't think it's that interesting. But if you want to know, let me know in the comments below and I will do my best to make that video for you. But I hope this video has been at least a little bit helpful and I hope that you can go out and make some great fire. If you enjoyed the video, again, I would love if you left a like, a comment and a subscribe. And as always, take care.